Good evening. Good evening. Welcome again to the midweek Wednesday night Bible class, Bible study for the Southside Church of Christ here in Orlando, Florida. We are so glad and happy you've joined us tonight in this exhaustive study of God's book, the Holy Bible. We hope, trust, and pray that all of us will leave just a little bit better than when we came as we see is their word from the Lord. Glad and happy we are at the Southside Church of Christ with all God is doing, has done, and all God has yet to do in this ecclesia at our great and beautiful and wonderful congregation. Exciting news, as you know, is on the way. We lifted our mass mandate last Sunday, the first Sunday in May. We're going to start our educational uh, process, our program again on the first Sunday in June, that's June 5th. Sister Eunice Johnson and all of our teachers and staff are waiting with tiptoe anticipation for you, you and especially you. Bring your children, bring yourselves so we can begin to study God's word again for the Sunday school phase of our church. 10 a.m. will be our Sunday school from 10 a.m. to 10.45 and then we'll have a little break, bathroom break, and then we'll begin our worship um, at 11 a.m. Now that's starting June 5th. Right now in the main auditorium, we are having adult class only. They are preparing the classrooms. That's why there's a little delay with the kids. But our adult uh, Sunday school starts at 10 a.m. now and shall continue. And then on June 5th, we will inculcate the children's phase of our Sunday school ministry. And then don't forget, Sunday, June, tw uh, May 29th, rather, um, uh, we want you to be there for our Southside homecoming. It's the first one we've had in three years. Dr. Rodney Doolin, the great evangelist minister uh, for the uh, Central Point Church of Christ in Dallas, Texas will be our guest and featured speaker. I want to remind all of our members, that'll be a good time. You had not been there in a while. Just come home. Let us uh, get a look at you, shake your hand, get a hug from you. Uh, Sunday, May 29th, homecoming. There's no th place like home. That's our theme. Our colors are purple and white, and uh, we will not have, this year, we will not have the 5K walk. We will not have the Saturday concert. We will at 9.30 on the uh, fifth Sunday in May, homecoming Sunday. We'll have praise and exhortation at 9.30 until 11. Dr. Doolin will bless our hearts and our souls. And we want to remind you also this year, and only this year, we will not have uh, our Shepherd's Feast, our annual Southside cookout. Just govern yourselves accordingly. Come home for homecoming for there's no place like home. Beloved, tonight, I want to talk to you from a theme of judging others. Judging others. That's our lesson tonight. It's a very important theme. It's relevant. It's useful, helpful, and beneficial that we study and see what God's Word teaches about judging others. It's one of those areas in life that I think we all are challenged with. It's one of those areas in Christianity there's a temptation to engage in judging others. Who was it that said that we judge others by their worst moment, but we judge ourselves by our best intentions? Uh, that is so true. If you're not careful, we will judge others at their worst moment. But life is not a Polaroid picture. Life is a motion picture. <clears throat> Please don't take a snapshot of me, or neither should I take a snapshot of you at your worst moment or your worst pose. But no, look at the totality of the movie, or the totality of a person's life, or each book and chapter of their life before we cast a judgment. 
Let's talk tonight about judging others. Uh, we shall use Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, as the hallway uh, to walk for a few phonetic moments tonight as we dissect and uh, pontificate on this subject of judging others. In Matthew chapter 7, our Lord is in the midst in the throes of his most powerful sermon preached here on the celestial ball called planet Earth. Uh, it's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7 are commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. He starts out in that sermon, you might recall, by man's relationship to God. But that segued and catapulted him into a discussion about man's relationship to other men. Judging others is how Matthew 7 opens. As you recall, Matthew 7 and 1, he actually says, Judge not, lest ye be judged. Matthew 7, 1 through 6 kind of gives us a template on how we ought to govern ourselves when it uh, relates to judging others. Now, let me say at the onset of this lesson, uh, it does not forbid all manner of judgment. Sometimes we misuse verse 1 because it says, Judge not, lest ye also be judged. What Jesus speaks of here hear me well, so we learn together, is unjust criticism. He's talking about unjust judgment or unjust criticism or critique. The Bible does not forbid us from judging. It just forbids us from unjust judging or misuse of judgment or unjust criticism. Any adverse or unfavorable criticism is not always, should not always be cast as judgment. Sometimes when people point out a fault we have or issue we have and offer us constructive criticism, please let us not categorize that as judgment. Sometimes when you prepare at church and home, uh, you are compelled, parents are and leaders are, to exercise discipline upon members or children or those under their umbrella of leadership. It requires a level of judgment. Sometimes it's a moral judgment or a spiritual judgment. And certainly you and I don't want to get in a situation where we have to have legal judgment. But when people are prepared to discipline and commanded the discipline, it requires somebody to make a judgment about guilt or innocence or your role or another's role in an event or an affair. So the Bible does not forbid judgment. We find tonight God, through Jesus, is talking about unjust criticism and unjust judgment. Yes, constructive criticism is helpful to you. Some people are so fragile uh, that they cannot have anything but that a boy, a pat on the back. You tend not to grow from that. You tend to grow when somebody you love and respect and know what they're talking about offer you some constructive criticism. And so tonight, let's launch into that under two umbrellas. Let's talk first about proper judgment, and then we'll talk about improper judgment. Y'all get it tonight? We're talking about judging others. Now, what is proper judgment, according to the Bible, specifically Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6? What is proper judgment? And then let's talk uh, secondly about improper judgment. If you look at the context and the content of this scripture, <clears throat> even in this text, Jesus makes a judgment and he commands us to make a judgment. In verse 6 of Matthew 7, the Bible says, He made us 
uh, put us in a position. He talks about do not cast our pearls to swine. And also, we have to decide who are the dogs, give our word to the dogs, or cast the pearl to the swines. Well, you got to judge right there who's dogs and who's swine. You have to make a judgment about people's behavior, people's intentions, people's actions. Sometimes you got to judge people's attitude, their disposition, their facial expression, their body language, their consonants. Yeah, you have to, all of us have to make a judgment. So when Jesus said, don't cast the pearl to the swines or give the word to the dogs, right there alone you got to make a judgment. Who's a dog and who's a hog? There's a dog in verse 6 and there's a hog in verse 6. Dogs are not hogs. Hogs are not dogs. You and I got to make that judgment. Church of leadership has to make that judgment. Leadership in the home has to make that judgment. Your supervisor on the job, the CEO of a company, everybody has to make judgments. What God through Jesus is teaching the church is how to make proper judgment. He's not forbidding judgment. He is forbidding proper judgment. Matthew chapter seven, verse 15 through 20. The Bible says the church, particularly leadership, but Christians are authorized to judge who's and who's not a false teacher. You remember in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, and Jesus capsules by saying, uh, by their fruits shall you know them. And he closes by saying, a tree is known by the fruit it bears. Beloved, somebody's got to judge what fruit that is. And he's not talking about apples and oranges and pears and, and, and kiwi. He's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, uh, self-control, kindness, goodness. Against such there is no law. Somebody's got to judge fruit. Somebody's got to be a fruit inspector. Somebody's got to judge whether that fruit, that apple has a worm in it. See, the Bible is not talking about making judgment, but you have to be on guard, be careful, be double dog careful to offer fair, a proper judgment, impartial judgment, a consistent judgment, uh, fruit inspectors, have to be frat. Don't throw out my apples and keep his oranges. If you're going to judge fruit, be consistent. Be fair. But you do have to judge. You have to judge people's intentions sometimes. Judge their actions. Judge their words. What does that mean? But don't be unjust when you judge. Matthew 7, 24, that same text. John, I'm sorry, John chapter 7, verse 24. The Bible says, judge with a righteous judgment. So there seems to be an inconsistent if you don't read your Bible properly. Matthew 7 verses 1 through 6 says, judge not unless ye also be judged. But when you go to John chapter 7 verse 24, that same Jesus says, judge with a righteous judgment. That leads me to believe he's never forbidden judging in Matthew 7, he's talking about unjust judging. And the reason I know that, he says in verse 1, and then verse 2 he says, because when you judge, the same matter, a meter, and measurement you judge others, ye shall also be judged. So he's warning us, be careful when you judge other people. When you assail other people's character, or you impugn their motives, that's how God would judge you. That's the meaning of judging not. For we go on in John 7, 24, judge with a righteous judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 13, judge those inside the church or the local congregation. Leaders have to judge our members. 
One of the most disturbing things, I was just preaching in Detroit, Michigan. Most of you know I was not at Southside Sunday. And by the way, my schedule is picking up again, you know. Uh, COVID uh, kept us all uh, quarantined for over two years. I enjoy being home all the time. When I say home, I mean at church and home at home with the family. Oh, I loved it. But as fate has it, now my schedule, I'm here, I'm in Detroit, going to Oklahoma, going to Texas, going to North Carolina. It's just, again, just my lot in my ministry. I'm thankful uh, for the opportunities, yet at the same time, it can be taxing. I travel to a lot, the larger point I'm making, I travel to congregations all over the length, breadth, and width of this country, and sometimes the world. And I'm never inclined, with all my vast experience, 38 years now, as a minister and evangelist, I do not make judgments of other people at other congregations. Too often, we have a brotherhood that's shaped that they think they give edicts and commands to other congregations. No, we are here to lead, direct, exhort, admonish, and discipline our congregation. Charity, the Bible says, starts at home. When God puts a man in charge of his home, that's it. He's in charge of his home. He cannot run his neighbor's home. He cannot run his family's home, his brother's home. Uh, many marriages dissolve because in-laws who become outlaws want to run their house and your house. No, that's, God never ordained that. Even in the local church, there's autonomy. We, the elders and I, have authority from God to lead, direct, and discipline the Southside Church. Judging what happens at Southside. You know, some people always tell me, ah, oh, but then so-and-so over there said something about this. Well, ain't none of they, my granddad said, ain't none of they cock out did this. What goes on in the South? You're not even a member. I'm not going to listen to people's critique, criticism, who do not even attend our church. Ain't putting a dime in the collection. And don't put yourself in the pew. Why am I listening to you? No, I'm interested in working with our leaders and our members to make our congregation the best South side can be. And you'll find in life, when you tend to your own business, you do everything you're supposed to do in your own house, your own church, your own life, you probably don't have a whole lot of time to be worried and critiquing somebody else. 1 Corinthians 5, 9-13, judge those inside. And Paul's talking about the local congregation where you are. You may be qualified to know those people, but not others. That's proper judgment. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Try the Spirit by the Spirit. That's a judgment. It, it's, it's comparison. It's looking at this, comparing it to that, and make a judgment which one is better, which one is best, which one is bad, which one should I avoid. There are times you've got to make a call. You've got to make a judgment. You've got to make an assessment. Make sure it's not unfair. It's not unjust. Make sure it's consistent. Make sure there's no nepotism in it. Yes, because however, this is Matthew 7 and 2, however you judge other people. He's not forbidden judging. However you judge people, make sure it's just and fair. Because if you're unjust, that's the same way God will be forced to deal with you. And when you make proper judgments, there's so much I can say about uh, proper judgment. It pleases God. Now let's talk a moment about improper judgment. In Matthew 7, our text for the night, when we get to verse number 3, now remember verses 1 and 2 says, Judge not, lest ye be also judged. And then verse 2 says, For the same measure, a meter you judge other people, God is forced to judge you. If you're harsh with other people, judging them unfair, unjust, that's how God's going to do you. When we get to Matthew 7 and 3, it explains what unfair, improper judgment is. That's where we are now. 
improper judgment. He gives a definition. He says, some of you all trying to get splinters out of your brother's eye and ignore that beam in your own eye. You can see what's wrong, judge other people, but you can't see or correct what's wrong with you. In other words, often in life, I think we all have a hint of this, we're blind to our own faults. <clears throat> That's why the Bible says, use the Bible as a mirror, not a telescope looking for other people's faults. We're blind to our children's faults. Blind to our own grandchildren's fault. Blind sometimes to our spouse's fault. People you love and close to, you're often blind. <clears throat> That's why they will not allow you to sit on a jury to judge your child or your spouse. You can't even be compelled to testify against your spouse. Because love often blinds us to the faults of people we're close to. And then we'll give them a pass and then put everybody else in jail. Jesus said in this same text, here's what's improper judgment. When you can see what's wrong and judge, critique, criticize, complain. I have people come to me, point out something wrong with me and they're dead right. And then when you flip it, say, okay, yeah, now you finish. Here's what I see about you. And they're vehemently denied, mad, angry. So you only have one 2020 vision is when you can see both ways. It's not 20 zero vision. So Jesus taught in Matthew 7, verses 3 to 5, don't be blind to your own faults. You can see that big old beam, that target on somebody else. But you cannot see, you can see that splinter in my eye rather, but that big beam in your eye, you can't see it. You have to be careful and prayerful. I've learned and still learning in the latter part of my ministry. The leaders will tell you, I got members who want you to just uh, nail people on a cross, cast them out, be mean, harsh, get them, get them, get them. And I'm sitting there and the elders and I talk, they don't remember what they did, what they said, what they didn't do. And they wanted compassion. They wanted mercy. They wanted leniency. They wanted prayer. But they see what's wrong with their brother or sister and they want a crucifixion. That's what the Lord is wanting us is improper judgment. Paul goes on in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one. Hi, Paul, in the spirit of meekness. Considering yourself, while you dealing with other people's shortcoming, Paul reminds us, consider yourself, lest ye also be tempted. So even when you're being forced to be judgmental, you're forced or commanded to make an assessment of other people's life or shortcoming. Why are you doing it? <laughs> Consider yourself. Why are you doing it? I said, well, you know, I struggle with something. Ain't what you struggle with, but I do too. I fall short. I've been in the church a long time. I see you falling short, but I do too. You better think about, consider yourself and get off that high horse of high judgment, but for the grace of God goes all of us. That's improper judgment. When you're harsh, mean, and insensitive, and unjust, you're a criticizer, you're a critiquer, but nobody can tell you anything. Nobody can point out your shortcoming. Nobody can point out where you fall short. It is righteous to show people the error of their ways. That's not what God's forbidding. It's righteous for you to help me. Come to me in private. Don't embarrass me, you know. Do the Priscilla and Aquila. Pull me to the side. Tell me in love what you see. There's no problem with that. I receive that. Now, what I'm not going to receive is you come at me, Billy Bad. 
Uh, you come at me loud and bodacious to embarrass me. Or you come at me and then refuse to be corrected yourself. That's improper judgment. That's what the text is saying. Read Matthew 7, 1 through 6. Very powerful. He talks about hogs and hogs and um and uh dogs. Be careful about what you give the hogs and dogs at verse 6. He talks about beams and eyes. And he talks about judgment. That black robe you put on to sit in judgment, be careful. Because that's how you're going to be judged. So when you think about people, you assess people, consider yourself. It'll make you sensitive, compassionate. You better stop talking about other people, children. You better watch those. You, you better start talking about other You know, uh, when, when you get older, you start gaining weight. The old people, there are people that come treat the young people. Oh, he or she done gain weight. You better consider yourself. Everybody in your family big. One day you're going to get big. Consider yourself. It's easy to see what's wrong with me. It's easy for me to see what's wrong with you. It's way more difficult for us to place proper judgment on ourselves. So Paul says in Galatians 6 and 1, do a proper introspection. When you're trying to help other people to be righteous, just remember, we are all strugglers together. And God, in proper judgment, is when you judge without mercy, without love, when you're harsh, or when you're self-righteous. James 2.13 reminds us of self-righteous judgment. When we have no mercy for people, but you want mercy for yourself. The Bible says and teaches proper judgment is when you consider yourself. Proper judgment is when you do it with those whom you have a symbiotic relationship with. Proper judgment, the Bible teaches, is when we have the capacity and the wherewithal uh, to understand the difference between hogs and dogs. Proper judgment is when we can tear fruit from leaves. That, that, that's proper judgment, when we can test or try the spirit by the spirit. Improper judgment is when we're harsh, cruel, lack mercy and love, uh, when we don't forgive others, when we don't uh, treat others by the golden rule which is do unto others as you have them do unto you. Improper judgment is when you don't do a proper introspection of your own life, even when you're trying to be corrected to others. And those of us who are being corrected, you can't be so ultra sensitive. Constructive criticism is good for everybody. But always remember to look in your own eye. Sweep off your own front porch before you bring your broom to my house and try to sweep off mine. Vacuum your own carpet, mop your own floor before you start mopping mine I'm vacuuming my carpet. Jesus taught that in Matthew 7, 3 and 5. Get that beam out your eye before you go get the splinter out of somebody else. That's improper judgment. Let's try to exercise with everything it is. Remember, the Bible does not teach against judging. It just teaches against unjust judging, improper judgment. And then he directs us on how to properly judge or help, encourage, exalt, and admonish one another. Oh, what an exhilarating time tonight talking about judging others. Don't uh, forget that this Sunday, May 8th, is Mother's Day. Yay! Come, be with us at 4701 Raleigh Street, 10 o'clock adult class, 11 o'clock live stream. I need to inform you, we kind of played with some things. Our live stream will start at 11, not 10. A live stream in perpetuity will begin at 11 a.m., not 10 a.m. There's several reasons for that in consultation with my IT team. But I want you to know, if you can, be there. It's Mother's Day. Give your mother a treat. 
If not, live stream with us and then join us next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for an installment of the Wednesday Night Bible Class. Excitement's in the air. June 5th, we start Sunday school at Mass at large. And don't forget, Sunday, May 29th, Homecoming 2022, Dr. Rodney Doolin. And remember, there's no place like home. And remember what we talked about tonight concerning judging others. Good night. Be blessed. Hopefully, I'll see you on Sunday. Take care.